Yeah. Okay, uh, so let's get started. Um, so, my pleasure to introduce uh, Peter Branden uh, for the last talk of this workshop, and he's going to talk on uh, operations that preserve stability in Lorenzen polynomials. Thank you. Well, thanks for the invitation. So, this is um, based on three parts, uh, joined with Julius Porchea, June Ho, and Adam Marcus. <coughs> and yeah, so this is maybe the worst title of the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Very long. So some of you have seen the real title. I accidentally showed it. No, I was in inspired by a talk yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> the dreams may come true with stability too. <laughs> well, we'll see. So. So this workshop is about hyperbolic polynomials and hyperbolicity cone and hyperbolic programming. So let's start with motivation uh, concerning that topic. So if we have a hyperbolic polynomial and it's hyperbolicity cone, which we've been talking about several times this week, then uh, we may take the uh, directional derivative <coughs> in the direction of any vector in, in the hyperbolicity cone. <coughs> And then you get a new polynomial, which is hyperbolic again. And the hyperbolicity cone relaxes the original hyperbolicity cone. So we get a larger hyperbolicity cone. So we get a sequence of relaxations. So if we have a degree d polynomial, then we can do this d minus 1 times. And we, get, uh, we, we end up with a half space. And this map is, of course, a linear operator, and it preserves hyperbolicity. <coughs> and we know that the hyperbolicity cones behave nicely under this operation, too. Right. So uh, a general question. So, so, so this has been used several times in hyperbolic programming by Jim Renegar, for example. And they sometimes call the Renegar derivatives in that setting. So a natural question is, are there other such preservers? And can we determine how, how they deform the hyperbolicity cones in questions? But our setting is somewhat different. So we, our setting is instead in terms of stable polynomials. But we shall see that these are the same gadgets, or their cousins, at least. So a polynomial is stable. <clears throat> well, a multivariate polynomial with real or com complex coefficients is stable if it's non-zero whenever all the variables are located in the upper half plane. Okay. And for since we want for uh, since we want this uh, the set of uh, <coughs> the space of polynomials to be uh, closed, we also want the zero polynomial to be stable. So it's just for convention. So. This first guy is stable, of course, since the imaginary part is positive here. So if this has a positive imaginary part, then this whole thing has positive imaginary part. And this is real stable for the same reason. And, and this is stable because multiplying two to <coughs> numbers in the upper half plane can never give you a negative real number. Right? <coughs> so these are simple examples of stable polynomials. And maybe the, <clears throat> for many applications, an important property is that, well, uh, uh, is that well, if, we, if we're in one variable, then stability is actually equivalent to being real rooted. So all the roots, or all the zeros are real. We start with the real polynomial. If we start with the real polynomial. Yes. <clears throat> And so, so what's the uh, connections to stable polynomials? I've seen, we've seen, I think we've seen, seen this before. So if we, if we, do the homo, homo, if we homogenize our polynomial, <coughs> then uh, our original polynomial is stable if and only if the homogenized polynomial is hyperbolic with respect to this vector here. And the hyperbolicity cone should also 
contain the positive orphan in the original variables. So this is the tra how you translate between stable polynomials and hyperbolic polynomials. So from now on, we will focus on stable polynomials instead. And the question, central question we will look at to begin with is, is which linear, linear operators preserve stability? So let's go back and look at some brief history of this problem and why people studied it before. And I guess many problems in mathematics goes back to this. The variance of this problem, well, this entire function. So the Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to that, this entire function here that you get from the zeta function by clearing off the poles and, and, and doing this linear change of variables so that the critical line comes on the real line. So then the Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to that. This xi function may be approximated uniformly on compacts by real rooted polynomials, or equivalently that all the zeros of this entire function are real. And this was Riemann's original statement of the Riemann hypothesis. So this was the, maybe the original, or was the original motivation for Hamid, Lagarin, Jensen, and Polio, and others to study this question of which linear operators preserve real rootedness. Okay? But not all dreams come true. <laughs> Doesn't the stability. No. Well, so there's been recent uh, development by, yeah, uh, yeah but, uh, with, with the De Bruyne constant. Things for which we were, we were discuss about. Yeah. But yeah, it hasn't, it has not been successful. You can <laughs> <laughs> agree with that. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but what has been successful was Li and Yang's approach to the, <coughs> to phase transitions. And they were inspired by Polya's work on, 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 this, uh, on the Riemann hypothesis. <clears throat> so they, so they, in their original proofs, they used Polya's result to, to, to prove that uh, the partition function of the Ising model is non-vanishing whenever all variables lie in the right half plane, but by symmetry also by in the left half plane. So when you specialize all the variables, the one variable, all the, all the zeros lie on the uh, imaginary axis. Well, many of you are f familiar with the Liang theorem in, in the version where this, of the circle theorem where we instead, but this, this is the original statement of it. <clears throat> and then more recently, there's been interest in stable polynomials for, in combinatorics since stability gives many uh, inequalities among the coefficients that are useful for combinatorics and also in geometry and in other places. <clears throat> and even more recently, we've seen that the work of Marcus Srivastava and Spielmann used stability preservers to, in the work of Ramanujan graphs and the Kadesin singer problem. And even more recently, we've seen beautiful work of Anarian and Obes Garan in where they used stability in computer science and in particular for the traveling salesman's problem. So there's, yeah, so I guess this is the motivation or the brief history. So let's start with some simple examples. Of course, differentiating preserves stability and this is just the Gauss-Lucas theorem essentially. So to set up, we, <coughs> so there's we, we start by, by looking at uh, finite dimensional linear spaces of polynomials. So again, k is, is the real numbers or the complex numbers. And we look at all the <coughs> polynomials of bounded degree. So, so here kappa is some vectors of positive or non-negative integers. And the, the polynomials should be of degree at most kappa j in the jth variable. And then there's a 
convenient way to to uh, encode the linear operator. So if you have a linear operator from this space of uh, <coughs> polynomials of bounded degree into this space of polynomials, we, we may code the operator in this symbol. <coughs> and of course it gives, it, you can read off the linear operator from it since this x to the alpha is a basis. So, so for example, if we, if, we, if we take this ddx1, then what we get is So, so the first, uh, well, so w one of the first <coughs> theorems on, on uh, characterizing linear operators preserving rerootedness was Pauli and Shor's result from 1914, where they completely characterized uh, diagonal operators preserving rerootedness. <coughs> and, and this was so, so for, and then in 2009, Borciani um, proved, well, we, we were able to characterize any linear operator preserving, well, here, complex stability. <coughs> so, and the theorem is very, well, the, the condition is very simple. The T preserves stability <laughs> if and only if the symbol is stable, but now in the double the many variables instead. So it's a very simple condition. So again, if we take the derivative, well, <clears throat> to prove that the derivative uh, preserves stability, well, we, we only have to check that this is stable, but of course, taking two numbers in the upper half plane gives another number in the, in the upper half plane, so it's non-zero, so all these, so this is a product of non-zero numbers, which is non-zero again, so it's stable. And then <coughs> the theorem looks a little bit different for, for real polynomials. And so now we restrict ourselves to linear operators of rank two. But just for convenience, we, we can seem to characterize them in, in rank two and one, two. But, but to save some space, we <coughs> so a, a linear operator of rank greater than two, preserve stability if and only if the symbol is stable or the shifted symbol is stable. And this can be seen, well, the reason for why this appears is for this reason, that this linear operator preserves stability, of course. Question? Yep. Sorry, can you, instead of this uh, powers of linear form, take any real root of polynomial in X, this coefficient in Y? Like for definition of the symbol. Any real rooted polynomial. So you, take like, you apply your linear operator yeah. to uh, x plus y to the power kappa, right? Mm -hmm. And instead of this, can you take like product of real rooted polynomials in x, y, so this coefficient <coughs> y? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know what you want, why you want to do Okay, that. we can talk about that. You could? But I don't know if it, it will give a characterization. But anyhow, this, uh, this translates the upper half plane to the lower half plane. But since, uh, uh, since, yeah, since the coefficients are real, then complex zero comes <coughs> in, in conjugate pairs. So, so this operator preserves real stability too. And it translates between these two symbols. So, <coughs> and then one may go over to, well, if you want to consider not uh, finite dimensional <coughs> spaces of polynomials, but infinite dimensional spaces, we look at the Laguerre polar class. And the Laguerre polar class in n variables is the class of entire functions, which are limits uniformly on compact, compact su subsets of CN of real stable polynomials. So for example, if we take e to the negative x, y, well, this is the limit of these. And these are, as we saw before, these are stable. <clears throat> so what is the symbol of, a, of an arbitrary 
uh, linear operator. Well, <coughs> we cannot do what we did before, but we can do this instead. So, so we, we form this. Uh, so this is a formal power series a priori, but this is the transcendental symbol that we want to work with. And the theorem just translates so that a linear operator preserves stability <coughs> or real stability if and only if either the symbol is stable or the shifted symbol is stable. Again. <coughs> so in particular, the, the identity operator should preserve stability, and this is the symbol of the identity operator. Right? So, so one maybe a bit surprising fact is that we get sort of that this is an entire function. This has to be an entire function in order for T to preserve uh, real stability. <coughs> so we just assume that it was a, a formal power series. So again, an example then, if we take this operator that it's easily seen to preserve uh, stability, well, at least by this theorem, then if we apply it to, to if, we, if we form the, the symbol, then these y's jump down, and this is, <coughs> this is in the lagarde polar class, and this is stable, so the, the product of these two must be in the lagarde polar class again, so this must preserve stability. <coughs> So in particular, for if we want to look at one variable and we want to look at linear operators that preserve real rootedness, this is if and only if uh, the symbols are in, one of these symbols are in, in the lagarde polar class in two variables. So a natural question, which I haven't seen an answer to yet, is if there is a transcendental version of the helton vinikov theorem. So the helton vinikov theorem says that any, so if, these, if this is a stable polynomial that in two variables, then we can, in, in two real variables, <coughs> then we, we can find uh, uh, symmetric A, B, and C of the same degree, for which, of oh, the same size as the degree, so, so that, uh, <coughs> yeah, so that, well, now for stability, we can, uh, this means that B plus C is the identity matrix. But, <coughs> what would the helton vinikov theorem look like for in this transcendental version? What, what would A, B, and C be, and what would the determinant be? Would it be Friedholm determinants, or what would it be? Yeah. This is a natural question that someone should try to solve. <laughs> this is a nice example, like F being an exponential or something like this. And somehow it's a concrete situation, but well, such things. No, no, with, with such a representation. With such a representation, yeah, but then you would, so w then you have to decide what the de determinant should be. What is the infinite determinant? Is it a Friedholm determinant or is it a, <coughs> I guess, yeah, so. I mean, the idea is to replace by entire functions. Yeah. So this, uh, this should be an entire function. So now to something completely different. So um, we've seen discrete convexity in this workshop too, several times. And um, we haven't seen the name polymetroid, but we've seen the name m-convex. And I don't know. Well, so there are several synonyms to this. So, but I like to call these gadgets polymetroids or m-convex sets. So a finite, so, so we look at a finite subset of, of uh, the lattice CN. And this is called a polymetroid. If whenever you have two vectors alpha and beta in your polymetroid M, <coughs> and uh, the coordinate, the ith coordinate is bigger in alpha than in beta, then we should be able to move in the direction to beta. So, so we should find some, some index J such that uh, the beta is bigger in the jth coordinate, and that so 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 that we can move, so we can add uh, subtract the one yeah one from alpha, and add one to, and add one in the jth coordinate, so we come in again. 
So this sort of uh, yeah, it shouldn't have too many holes, and we should be able to move. Sort of, yeah, we should, should be able to jump from one to another discreetly. And, and you are not assuming the reverse condition in beta? You can, yeah, which is equivalent. So there's an equivalent version that you can actually add that, yeah, that should be so, yeah, beta minus, minus ej plus ei. So it's the same. So, so if, uh, if, if we would have 0, 1 to the n instead of z, and this would be the basis uh, change, uh, exchange axiom. So therefore, yeah, this is a polynomial. <coughs> and how does it relate to polynomials? Well, if we have a polynomial, we, we may look at the support of the polynomial, which is this, the, the indices for which uh, the Taylor coefficients are not zero. And then <clears throat> in the big paper from 2004, they noticed that the support of any homogeneous and stable polynomial is always a polymatroid. I don't know if they did it for polymatroid, but they did it for matroid, and then you can easily do it for polymatroids. <clears throat> but and they left us as, as an open question if all the, can all polymatroids or all matroids be, be uh, representable in this way? And fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you see it, this is not the case. So the, if you take the Fano matroid, F7, then it's not the support of any stable polynomial. <coughs> We've seen CLC polynomials before, but we like to call them Lorentzian. And Gurbitz likes to call them SLC polynomials. But so, <coughs> so if we represent a, a quadratic by its Hessian, I guess. <coughs> and if this Hessian, has, well, if this polynomial or quadratic has non negative coefficients, then it's not hard to see that uh, the, the polynomial is stable if and only if uh, A has exactly one positive eigenvalue. So the signature is plus, minus, 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 minus. Or it could have some zero eigenvalues too. But. So it should have a Lorentzian signature. <coughs> so this is how we define Lorentzian <coughs> polynomials. So a homogeneous polynomial of degree D with positive coefficients is strictly Lorentzian if whenever you differentiate it d minus two times along the coordinate axis, you get a polynomial with Lorentz signature, strict Lorentz signature. So it sh should not be signature. It should be non-singular. <coughs> so whenever you differentiate it um, d minus two times, we should get the Lorentz signature. Okay. So this is the strange definition of being strictly Lorentzian. But we see since by this lemma, the, this, well, this essentially means that if you, if you um, differentiate d minus two times, you end up with a strictly stable polynomial. So this is sort of a, a, um, a relaxation of being strictly stable. And uh, <clears throat> So then we, so this is the open, open condition and we define a polynomial to be Lorentzian if it, if it is the limit of strictly Lorentzian polynomials. And this is a quite, well, maybe complicated definition, so we could have used this as a definition instead, but maybe it would be harder to work with. So, so it turns out that a homogeneous degree D polynomial is Lorentzian if if, if and only if, so it should be if and only if here, if and only if the support is a polymatroid and it, whenever you differentiate it d minus two times, you get a stable polynomial. Or a, or the, or the Hessian is, uh, has, has a lower signature, it's the same thing. And one of the motivating polynomials is, the, the, the cases is the bivariate case. So what are these polynomials then? Well, if you differentiate d minus two times, 
then uh, you just have to check three, uh, a polynomial with three um, consecutive coefficients, and this um, the corresponding discriminant should be non-negative, and this amounts to this exact um, condition, which is the well the Newton inequalities. So, so, so for two variables, <coughs> this is just a it, it, it relaxes uh, stable polynomials, <coughs> re-rooted polynomials, to, to, to just satisfying the Newton inequalities. <coughs> so then, uh, fundamental examples are as follows. So if, if we have a polymatroid, then actually the, the exponential generating uh, polynomial for the set system is Lorentzian. So any polymatroid can be re represented as a Lorentzian polynomial. And for ma so, so if we inst if we have a matroid now, then and if we given the rank function of the matroid, then we may f form the following, which is a version of the multivariate tut <coughs> polynomial, and this turns out to be Lorentzian too, and which was important for our application because this gives uh, the, this proves this Mason's the strongest version of the Mason's conjecture. Another cute set of examples is that relates to Caroline's talk, Caroline's talk yesterday, is that if you have an M matrix, but Caroline considered just symmetric M matrices, but the definition makes sense for, for non-symmetric matrices too, and this is what we have. So we have any, any real matrix, um, which has um, non-positive non, non off-diagonal entries and all principal minors are non-negative. So this, this is a nice set of matrices and one may, may prove that actually the, <coughs> the, 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 the multivariate characteristic polynomial in this sense is, is always Lorentz. So this would maybe lead, well, could hint to some, some other version of the uh, helton vinicol theory. Maybe. <clears throat> yeah, so these are some examples from that paper, but the question we, we want to ask is, which linear operators preserve the Lorentzian property? <clears throat> okay, and the surprising thing is that the same kind of characterization holds. That well, not this is not not a characterization now, but it was one the 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 important direction holds that if if we have a if we have a linear operator whose symbol is Lorentzian, so it doesn't have to be stable, but suffices to be Lorentzian, then the operator preserves the Lorentzian property. Okay. So as a, so so any so if if the symbol is homogeneous and stable, then we know that it it is Lorentzian. So so T preserves the Lorentzian property then. So 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 this means that essentially all the if if T preserves stability then and homogeneity homogeneity then it preserves the, the Lorentzian property. So we can so for example differentiation or setting variables equal and, and so forth. But we can also get other kind of operators such as this. So say that we, the, we fix two vectors alpha and beta, alpha less than beta, <clears throat> and we, we, sh we chop off all the coefficients which are not in this in interval. So this is sort of a, well, it, it behaves very nasty when it comes to uh, zeros of polynomials. But it behaves very nicely with respect to the Lorentzian property. So we can sort of localize uh, polynomials in this way. <clears throat> and it's just to, yeah, it's just to compute the symbol and you will see that. Yeah, this, uh, the symbol will, will split up into a product of the disjoint variables and then you, it reduces to the, to the univariate case or the bivariate case. Yes. Not very hard. Better? Yep. 
Do you have to fix an order on end to the end? I mean, I guess you do lexicography or something. Oh, sorry. Yeah, coordinate wise. Yeah. So it's a discrete interval. So it's coordinate box. Yeah. Thanks for that. So it's a box. And, and that's because when you when you take a m convex set and you intersect it with a box, it's still m convex. Yeah. Yeah. And this is so, uh, result by how? Uh, yes. Yes. So this is one of the yeah, one of the. Or it's actually a consequence of it. The proof is just the uh, abstract um, analysis. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as a consequence, we get lowest result. And um, well, a nice non-example, maybe surprising to <coughs> to some, or it it relates to Nima's talk. That if you if you uh, if you, yeah, what do you say? If you take the inverse of the variables and then multiply by, by the, this ma maximum degree polynomial or, or monomial, then it, then it's easy to see that it preserves stability since the it maps the upper half plane to the lower half plane. All the variables, but it does not preserve the Lorentzian property. And this Neyman would very much like it to, do. <laughs> Yeah. Then some applications would be nice. Okay, so do I have ten minutes left, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll should have time for for this too. So then I come to the third part. So which tries to say something about how. how how, how the zeros, so, so now we know how to, when, when the linear operators preserve stability, but we don't know how, how the zeros move under the uh, transformations. So to look at this first, we look at the symmetric, symmetric additive convolution. It was studied by um, Marcus Srivastava and Spielman in, a, in their yes. convolutions. And this is defined as follows. And we want to look at the, the maximum zero of the, or, or the largest zero of a really rigid polynomial F. So now we, we look at univariate polynomials. And to do this, we, <clears throat> we want to see how, so sort of, we, we first want to deform the polynomial by, by, by this linear operator, and this linear operator is easily seen to preserve. Uh, whoa. Well, I should have had, I thought I had a proof. Well, uh, we've seen examples of this before, that this preserves stability. And this, you, you can just do this, uh, yeah, take the symbol of it. But, but what Marcus Srivastava and Spielmann proved was that that the, <clears throat> that the maximum zeros behaves very nicely with respect to this symmetric additive convolution. So this means that if, if you want to apply, if you want to apply this several times, you can sort of analyze how, how the zeros move because you can th this by 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 first multiplying by by, by by this linear operator, we, we can get some leeway. And if we do that, we can s sort of see that this helps us to see that the, the zeros don't, don't move too much. So this, this may be hard to appreciate this if you haven't seen it before, I must say. But you can maybe get a feeling for it. What's D, the degree? D is the degree. And then Leek and Ryder proved a, a very clean and nice theorem, so, which is sort of more, looks like submodularity, which, uh, which can be seen to, to, to generalize this theorem by, by taking uh, H to be a certain polynomial.
that if we're in interested in uh, real stable polynomials, <coughs> we don't have a max root, but what do we have? Well, we have the hyperbolicity cones, or let's call them. So in the literature, this set has been, co been called above the roots, but I, I don't know if, <laughs> not to be above the roots, but I don't know. The above root set is a good name. So let's call it the hyperbolicity set. So the hyperbolicity set is uh, is above the roots. Well, it's <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you look at the variety, then uh, it has a well, it has a co a component with, which is um, far furthest away to the infinity, and above this, where nice the hyperbolicity set. But another way of seeing is it, it is just the hyperbolicity cone uh, sliced with this x0 is equal to 1. So it is uh, a nice convex <coughs> set, <coughs> and which sort of which, which, which is essentially the max root. So this is what, what, what we want to keep track of. And indeed, for, for a univariate polynomial, this is exactly being above the maximum. <coughs> and the definition of the <coughs> the convolution is straightforward for multivariate. If you just do the same thing, and it's easy to see that this convolution preserves stability. Why? Well, we may fix we fix some stable polynomial G and look at this linear operator. And if you do the do the yoga, what you get is g applied to this vector x plus y. And this is a stable polynomial again, given that g is stable. And yeah, just as, as easy is to prove that this, uh, that if f is stable, then f minus some directional derivative of f along the positive orthant is stable again. Well, we, what we do is we can take the, the transcendental symbol and we get some linear form here with the non-negative coefficients, so, which is stable. And now we want to look at sort of the <clears throat> the, uh, we don't just want to look at the <clears throat> the hyperbolicity set of f, but we want to look at the hyperbolicity set of this f minus d omega. And this is sort of one way of seeing this is looking at some Cauchy transform of, of f. Because, well, if you take d omega f over f, this is the sort of Cauchy transform. Of the and indeed, there's a, there's a Straight. Well, there's there's a well the, there's a theorem that translates exactly as the uh, Marcus Spielmann and Srivastava theorem, <clears throat> but instead with the hyperbolicity sets. Although the the proof doesn't so the proof is somewhat differently different. We have to sort of yeah work a, quite a bit harder. <clears throat> but what is nice is that, well, this, this uh, convolution is as general as can be. Because you can get any linear operator as a convolution. So if you have any linear operator, then it's just a, 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 an al umbral calculus exercise to prove that that if you if you take t of t of f, f of x plus y where t acts on the x variables then it's actually a convolution of this type with the with the uh, with a symbol so we can what does it imply so it implies it, for example, it unifies all the different proofs of the different convolutions considered by 
marker spin minus service data. You can get a unified proof of all of them. And you can, uh, well, you can get some quantitative information for any linear operator. But sometimes it doesn't say much. <laughs> but sometimes it does. <clears throat> and even though uh, Leek and Ryder didn't see this theorem, they could conjecture a theorem that would imply it. Which is pretty good. But it's, yeah, I think this should be, one should be able to prove it, but I haven't tried to go through the details. But, <clears throat> yeah, it's a plausible conjecture. Should be true. It should give some general, and this should be can be can be then lifted up to a theorem concerning any linear operator, and then one can use it to, to get some even better better information on how the series move. But this is yeah. <clears throat> I don't have time to dwell on this, so I think I stop now. Questions? Yep. Uh, so, in the Marcus Kirchhoff's uh, building papers, they uh, they use the univariate result often to get nice true bounds. But then, when they go to multivariate setting, they often have to resort to barrier function methods. Uh, have you traced what the consequences of your theorem are? Do you have, like, how far can you push them and what kind of bounds do they get in this setting? No, we haven't. Short answer. But I don't think we'd get any better bounds on that for that because they're pretty open, right? There's some second order terms. So. Yeah. But, but, but you can get that bound for Caddis uh, and Singer out of it? <coughs> well, for. We can get some bound. We can use the um, asymmetric. Convolution that, as you did, but yeah, that is sort of a detour. We, I haven't tried to get any better bounds in using that. But I think uh, this, this is still not. There's no way of sort sort of sort of getting directly applying it to the Caddis and Singer problem. So this is this is a defect of it. So therefore we didn't. We haven't written it up yet. <laughs> so, but we yeah, we're about to. Bring Any other question? Any other dream that <laughs> <laughs> come true? So the dream didn't come true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's uh, thank Petron again. <clears throat> and also all the speakers of the other workshop. <laughs> <laughs>